Hello, everyone. Good morning. Um, greetings from sunny Costa Rica. Uh, today, I have the pleasure to take you on a journey, uh, a journey of what has been the history of gender in, with, within the CBD um, mandates. I would then uh, talk a little bit where countries are, and here's where I will use the example of Costa Rica to bring things down um, so we can see what countries are struggling with. And then I will finish off by talking a little bit uh, of what could be the next steps for policies and for decisions in the CBD, as well a little bit on the country work. So let's start off with the history. So the CBD is actually one of the most gender sensitive, using uh, the framework that uh, Francesca just presented, um, multi-environmental uh, agreement. And the reason why we were saying this is that gender, start, gender decisions started to trickle into the, the conference of the parties since 1996. This is before uh, the Climate Change Convention did it. It was before the Desertification Convention did it. And we see that this pattern, or that there is an evolution, of the number of decisions that you start to see. The COP that has had the most decisions so far has been the one in Nagoya. We had 13 decisions there where we have even a gender decision regarding one of the Aishi targets, which is number 14. After that, we see things leveling off a bit, and we, we start seeing that there are less gender decisions in the Hyderabad and the um, Korea, <clears throat> sorry, um, COP. Now, what do these decisions cover? These decisions cover many issues. They would cover issues related to conservation, thematic program, finance. There is a lot of them covering about gender balance in, in some of the bodies that are created. Of course, there are those related to the strategic plan, um, capacity building, benefit sharing, technology. But what is interesting about these decisions is that when we look at them using the social equity framework that, um, that Francesca just presented, we see that most of these decisions are regarding recognition and process. And very few of them actually talk about the equal distribution of benefits, costs, or responsibilities. Um, Perhaps those that are related to access and benefit sharing are the ones that, that do talk a little bit more about this distribution of benefits. There's some regarding finance. What does this mean? Well, let's look at one of the, the first, almost one of the first decisions. Um, this is Article 8J. It's uh, um, the article that, that um, covers all aspects related to indigenous people. And we see here the, exactly the pattern that I was showing you, that it recognizes the role of women and their contributions to the conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity. And then it emphasizes on strengthening their role and participation. So we see that the first part has that recognition aspect, and the second part has a participation aspect. This format and this decision repeats itself until even the Korea decisions. You start seeing the same pattern where, the, where there's a recognition of the role, and there, there's the emphasis on participation. Most of the process um, decisions are regarding participation and inclusion. Some of them do address um, capacity building, but very few do so. So we see a pattern here that we're doing great uh, in terms of recognizing women and ensuring that they can participate. But recently, we have seen that that might not be enough uh, because we start seeing that women are being involved and they are being um, included in the meetings. However, they aren't being included in decision making and they're not receiving the actual benefits, 
as I said, or costs of conservation are not equally distributed, or the responsibilities as well. So we do have a lot of work still. <laughs> and with regards to policy, there's a lot of food for thought on how we can move these patterns um, beyond these two realms and start thinking more in general about this social equity framework. So that leads us to now, to 2018, and where are countries? And what is interesting is that it is a robust policy framework with regards to gender. And the, the CBD is the first convention to also have a gender action plan. So this has really moved countries forward. And these mandates, I, I do have to say, have a great impact on the countries. And when developing their and these apps, we start seeing that gender starts trickling into these policies, from the international mandates or international policies to the national um, policy uh, that are addressed in the NDS apps. And so we start seeing that 56% of two, 256 NBS apps that were reviewed, these cover from 1993 to 2016, have included either women or gender as part of their, um, of their text. Now, that's great. It's an impact. We can measure it. However, when we start understanding how gender is addressed, we start seeing that these inclusions or this recognition of gender is always or almost always in the form of a um, principle or a guiding principle. And there are very few of them that actually talk about gender considerations in the activities or in the indicators of the NBSAPs themselves. In the case of Costa Rica, as I promised, um, we have had a really interesting process because we have been an example of this evolution of going from no recognition of gender to moving to a more gender responsive um, di dimension. Our policy law from 1996 is completely gender neutral. It only includes a general equity principle. Our national biodiversity policy starts recognizing these roles, the, these inequalities. And finally, our national diversity um, strategy, our NBSAP, becomes gender responsive because we have it included in one global goal, six national goals, and two indicators that address gender considerations in a diversity of topics. Now, with this national mandate, what we have is Costa Rica now developing its sixth national communication. And we have really tried to uh, develop a very unique approach where we have both looked at process and at the content. And process, we have done some um, sensitization um, workshops while developing and consulting the um, national communication that is going to be presented in December. And from a content point of view, again, the country has pushed a little bit the envelope and followed uh, some of the guidance provided by the Agenda Action Plan. And what we have really tried to do is start integrating gender disaggregated data when reporting the, about the different um, policies, uh, the different, sorry, global and national biodiversity targets. So, so far, we have included it in 14 of the um, 25 global um, goals that we have. We have also tried to include a lot of case studies that show how the country is implementing some of these mandates. We are including maps that relate gender and environmental data gender recommendations for each one of the global goals and really trying to focus on Aishi Target 14 to be able to provide as much data as possible. Um, here's just a map that shows you this is very excited. We're starting as a country. We do have a lot of information environmentally, so we were able to combine these two. We combine the percentage of women that own land by district and then we overpose different layers related 
for example, in this case, to um, low carbon productive systems. And that allows us to start understanding where are these women um, and how they can be, or we can start thinking how they can be involved in um, these biodiversity actions. So the future, in the last second that I'm left, I think that we need collectively to start thinking of theories of change that promote gender equality at different levels and that policies, we should try to think of a strategic way of having policies linked together so that we can talk about recognition, process, and distribution, and not only about recognition and process. I think that Aishi, in the next set of goals, need to take a page from the SDG and try to mainstream gender more comprehensively. Uh, we need to harmonize our Rio conventions um, in order to have similar um, mandates and more transformative implementation on the ground. And this, of course, requires um, ground guidance and support. And of course, the biggest challenge of them all, a list of uh, global and, and environment indicators to guide countries. Because countries, I feel, feel a little bit, um, a little bit yeah, lost when it comes to sometimes the implementation of all of these gender mandates. Thank you.